You're listening to Life of the Record, a podcast celebrating classic albums, as told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Jolie Holland grew up playing music in Houston, Texas, and was a traveling musician as a teenager. She formed the Be Good Tanyas with Samantha Parton in Vancouver in 1999. Shortly before the Be Good Tanyas released their debut record, Blue Horse, in 2001, Jolie Holland settled in San Francisco. It was there that she recorded the songs that eventually became Catalpa, released in 2003. As the album became an unexpected success, Jolie Holland signed to Anti Records, and released her first studio album, Escondida, in 2004. In this episode, Jolie Holland talks through the making of Escondida on its 15th anniversary. This is Jolie Holland. Escondido was made in four and a half days, and it was my attempt at bringing something that was really alive and wild into a studio. And I didn't know if that was going to work or not. Tonight, my heart is full of a sad song. My lonesome lover has taken off. I'm wandering around. On a cloud, empty hearted and down and down. I had this crazy experience when we were going out to Forestville to record it. I had an anxiety dream that morning that red winged blackbirds had gone extinct. And then I had to wake up and I had this like really packed to do list of all these things to get ready to go out to Forestville. And one of the things I had to do was get a lot of groceries because we were cooking for everybody. So I had like two big bags of groceries and I was standing on the street in the Sunset District. This was before I had a cell phone. So I had to call somebody at a certain time. So I was like at a payphone talking to somebody. And just right at that moment, a red winged blackbird flew over my head and landed in this branch right next to me. I really had probably seen a red-winged blackbird like five times in my life. Like I didn't know what their habitat was. And I had forgotten about the dream. You know, I just like woke up and I was like so crazy and just had so many things to do. And that was like two hours later after I dreamed that red-winged blackbirds had gone extinct that this one like buzzed over my head. And to me, that was like a sign of, you know, I was worried that something was going to go extinct but it's not. It just shows up. The studio doesn't have to be a place where music dies. I had never recorded something in the studio before. You know, I wanted it to feel really alive. I didn't know if it was going to be possible to do that. Well, our courtship was brief and magnetic. I was singing at the corner bar. And we both felt so romantic We took a walk with the moon Down to the train yard The band I had on Escondida is this great cross-section of all these beautiful musicians who were playing in San Francisco at the time. David Mahali was this great jazz composer who played drums with us. He also played marimba. Ara Anderson and Paul Scriver, beautiful horn players that were around at the time. Enzo Garcia on saw. Some of the best intonation I've ever heard on saw. Really beautiful player. Brian Miller, he had a band called The Speakers. And of course, Keith Carey, who plays upright bass. With all these musicians, like, we had these incredibly diverse sets, you know. Seth Augustus, who helped me do the layout for the record, he was playing with Paul Pena at the time, and he was like a Tuvan throat singing blues musician. Yeah, it was just this incredibly diverse, weird moment. (laughs) 
R. Anderson sounds good on trumpet. Yeah, I never play that song anymore. I saw you tonight by the light of the shining black stars that circle my heart. I saw you come in, though it was dim. Almost everything was recorded in Forestville, in the Redwoods. We were just sort of all holed up in this place. We were like renting a house around the corner. It was so isolated that we had to cook everything. Like there were no restaurants. There was no delivery. We recorded everything except Darlin' Ukulele in four and a half days. And then the rest of the time I, we had out there, we just mixed. My mind was reeling. Blood bleeding red like my guitar. Whoever you are, Black Stars is almost like a poem. I wrote it really quickly, I wrote it within like 15 or 20 minutes. And it does this thing where the center of the song, the tonal center, shifts back and forth. I just played that song with one of my favorite musicians, Doug Weaselman, and he said, oh, you are doing something with a structure where it ends in the middle. And at first I thought he was talking about the tonal structure shifting, but he meant that I sort of had come back to like a central like how I had reiterated part of the lyrics were an expression of that. So I thought that was an interesting take. I am fishing for wishes That's where you come in Though it was done I wrote Old Fashioned Morphine in my head on the city bus on my way to an early morning waitressing gig. And I had just been reading about the history of medicine or something. So that's where it came from. Give me that old fashioned morphine. Give me that old fashioned morphine. Give me that old fashioned morphine. That's good enough for me. So I wrote the song in my head on the bus. And then a few days later, I was at a party at a big house in Pacific Heights. This is back when artists could afford to live in Pacific Heights. And I think I was just playing this song. I think Enzo Garcia was there with the saw. And then Ara Anderson and Paul Scriver just showed up out of different places at the party with saxophone and trumpet and just started doing New Orleans-style cacophony. So the arrangement was... Just like, I don't know, it just arose so naturally. You're supposed to put the biggest song as third, you know. Who knows if you'd change the order. I don't think if you change the order, Old Fashioned Morphine wouldn't stand out. I had some friends die of overdoses, and so I felt bad about, you know, I just, I don't really like um, romanticizing drugs. 
I don't know, people are so literal, you know, like, and if you want to, if, if something is a joke, it's like, it almost is to hit people over the head. I was good enough for belly burrows. I was good enough for belly burrows. I was good enough for belly burrows. It's good enough for me. So I mean, it's kind of shocking to me that that's my sort of most well-known song. My friend Keith Carey, who plays upright bass on that song, he was just telling me yesterday, he was like, you know, people like play that around campfires and stuff. You know, I mean, that's weird and cool to me. Like nobody's ever done that in front of me. (laughs) So it just seems like a a mysterious thing. Amen, there's a ring around the moon I'm going to fly all night down to see you I'm gonna fly all night down to see you There's a road drifting through the mountains I'm gonna fly down that road until I get Amen is the first song that I wrote under the influence of Michael Hurley. I was like a deadhead for Michael Hurley for like 10 years, and that's right when it started. Something about his sense of structure got into that song, and I'm not sure how that imprint comes across. I think it was just something in the structure. I'm gonna fly all night down to see you silvery moon so fine and the earth tastes like wine and the road slips and slides Amen is sort of about this one time when I drove down or up the five I can't remember probably up the five on a full moon night and Mount Shasta was covered in snow and it kept like reappearing and disappearing when you're in the foothills because the foothills were all dark and then Mount Shasta is like covered in snow, white and just like reappearing every once in a while. It was so entrancing, it was incredible. Mad Time of Bedlam is an unrehearsed first take. And I remember seeing some review from Australia where it was like, you know, it was like somebody who like probably expected me to be like a very uptight kind of folky or whatever, or like maybe they're just an uptight folky, but they're like, it sounds like she's just singing whatever she wants to sing and then banging on some stuff. And then like, it was like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, anyway, I can't play the drums like that. Nobody can play the drums like that. That's David Mahali. To see my time of bed, I'm 10,000 miles. I'll travel mad. My lung goes on dirty toes to save her shoes from gravel. It's well that we sing Bonnie Boys, Bonnie Man Boys. Bedlam boys are Bonnie for They all go bare and they live in the air and they want no drink nor money. I went down to Satan's kitchen for to break my fast one morning. Everything was totally planned out before we went in. The only thing that wasn't planned was Mad Tom of Bedlam, and that was like um, really just like blowing off steam. You know, recording can be so detail oriented and intense, and like, you know, we were working very quickly. Yeah, Mad Tom of Bedlam was just like blowing off steam and just fooling around. Tonight I'll go a murder around the man and the moon to a powder his dog. I'll shake and a stuff, I'll break and I'll howl a wee bit louder. It's well that we sing Bonnie Boys, Bonnie Mad Boys, Bedlam Boys, all Bonnie for They all go bare and they live in the air and they want no drink nor money. I wrote Poor Girls Blues when I was 17 and a homeless teenager. Oh, maybe I'm a poor girl. 
that doesn't bother me at all. Maybe I'm a poor girl, but it doesn't bother me at all. Wow, 2004 seems, it feels so long ago. My boyfriend at the time had this attic in a house, the attic of this old Victorian. So, you know, it was the size of like a very large studio apartment, just the one room. The rent was from the 70s. I paid $150 a month. I remember my boyfriend at the time had some family money and he was going to buy a house in San Francisco. But he said, like, wouldn't that just be a waste of money? I mean, this is probably just a bubble. <laughs> Which is really grotesque <laughs> to think about that now. I know a round balloon crosses Driving me crazy and wild I know a round balloon crosses She's driving me Overdubbed vocals almost never sound good to my ears, at least not for the aesthetic that I was looking for. Somebody who can do really good overdubbed vocals is, it's like you're being a great actor or something. You know, like you can just like pull yourself into the environment completely. I've taken, you know, what I thought of as like vocals that needed to be fixed and tried to sing over them to fix parts or whatever. And in my estimation, almost nothing is as good as the live take with the band. I'm premeditating and crime of a personal kind. I'm about to go out of my mind. I'm just about sick to death of taking breath and walking this line of mine. Now, folks that know what's good for them. Goodbye, California represents my greatest failure as a producer on this album. I really wanted to cut it again, and everybody said, No, it sounds great. <laughs> And to this day, I wish I hadn't listened to them. I wish that I had recorded it again. Nobody was calling the shots over my head, you know, except for I let people talk me into leaving that take of Goodbye California, you know. And most people wouldn't regard that as a failure, but I do. <sighs> goodbye, goodbye, California. Goodbye, and I'll be moving on. I sang you my songs, I know I'm wrong. Fare they well, and I'll be going on. I think I was like nervous, and my accent kind of got carried away. I don't know why I'm so critical of that take. I recorded it again on something that never got re released, so. Yeah, maybe someday I'll release a version that I like and nobody will care. <laughs> it's like the director's cut. Like, who cares? <laughs> when I'm dead and gone, my immortal home will hold me in its bosom safe and cold. No more desires will light their fires or disturb my immaculate calm. But my great consolation prize is that Bob Dylan played that track on his radio show and he talked about me. That was really exciting. That's the only reason I'm not 100% ashamed of it. Oh,
I was rehearsing Do You yesterday with this great pedal steel player. It sounded so good. It's sort of from the perspective of like when you're a teenager and you have like sort of hopes and dreams and then one of your friends starts like becoming a boring old alcoholic and you're like, why? <laughs> you know, like that's your life, you know. That's kind of where it's coming from. But obviously uh, it's open to whatever people might feel about it. That's a long night that says to have no end. There's big stars. The line, big stars falling, it's a reference to a Blind Willie McTell song. It's called Mama, It Ain't Long for Day. It was recorded, I think, in like 1927, and it's it's when Blind Willie McTell just sounds like a kid. You know, he sounds like, he sounds like a young prince or something. Like he has this intense, like magical quality to the way he plays and sings. What did you do when I called? Did you hear me at all? You motherfucker, I wanted you. I remember when Escondido was featured on United Airlines. They had like a picture of me in the in the United magazine. They had taken two songs out of the track listing. They took Do You out and they took Old Fashioned Morphine out to make it like Mormon safe or whatever. <laughs> uh. The beginning has improvisational elements to it, like um, David Mahali's playing this really beautiful rosewood marimba that he had. So it kind of like, it has sections that are open for improvisation, but it does have a structure. I feel like those kind of structures in my music are like a nod to like Don Cherry or something, like this kind of like folkish improvisation. Darling ukulele that I've been dreaming of Darling ukulele that I love When I'm in San Francisco I'm dreaming all the time Deep in the park where the constellations shine. Darlin' Ukulele was actually recorded as part of Catalpa, and then it just made sense to mix it for this record. It was sort of one of the most interesting tracks that we got when we were recording stuff for Catalpa. It was about this little red ukulele that somebody gave me. Catalpa was like bits and pieces. I had a friend in town who was like um, like a noise artist, and he also made quilts, and he would raffle off his quilts to survive. <laughs> like um, he was kind of a really obnoxious person to have at a show. Like he would come to the show and like try to tell you what to do, and using like very oblique, weird language. And you wouldn't change a thing. And then he would say, that's right. That's right. Do it like that. Like as if you had understood this crazy thing that he'd told you to do. He's hilarious. He's a total character. 
this guy, Chris Arnold, like as an art project, I just gave him a bunch of tracks. And it was almost like the kind of stuff that, you know, any songwriter just has around, like all these stray recordings. And I said, why don't you put this together? Like, would you arrange this as a record for me? And he put it together and he said, what do you think? And I didn't even listen to it. And I said, it's great. That's fine. Awesome. Thanks. Like, I didn't care. You know, it was just like, I let him put it together. And then I was just selling it at shows. And then when I finally did listen to it, I was like, why did you put all the coughs on there? Like, there's two coughs. He's a filmmaker, too. So it's like, he has that perspective of like, the document of the moment is more important than, you know, something being polished. And... I think that's part of it, you know, like that's part of why Catalpa is so interesting is because it doesn't have these aesthetics of other records. And I remember like when Escondida and Catalpa were so successful and they were kind of like generated in this really non-traditional way, working so fast and like working live and not working to a click. These other artists would ask me for advice and I would tell them, like, don't work with a click, just do it live. And nobody wanted to do that. They didn't believe me. And I don't know. It is very naked. I hid out on the front porch. I light up in my mind. I looked for me a lover. The best one I He got himself a ticket on an international flight Oh, it's nothing but a goddamn shame Is what it is Oh, it's nothing Damn Shame was about I was dating this dude that went to go work in Russia for almost a year And so it was, like, autobiographical. I had just written it. I think that's the newest song on Escondida. I think I'd only written it, like, a month before the recording, which is why it's so extremely bare bones. Like, it's pretty much just me playing the piano. The smell of burnt exhaust Drifts down to the bar It's midnight in California It's high noon where you are Motorcycles and booze And this dirty old perfume Oh, it's nothing but a goddamn shame Is what it is Oh, it's nothing I recorded Damn Shame on the record Just to keep that sense of freshness And like, you know, just that open-endedness And not that kind of mystery in the music. And I've always valued that. And I I mean, it's really hard to approach things that you really admire, you know, because your ego sort of gets in, your, in the way. Like you think, oh, I really want to do this thing, but because I'm doing it, it won't be great, you know? So you kind of have to trick yourself into doing certain things sometimes, you know, to sort of sidestep your ego. Have you heard that thing that they say about the Lonious Monk? That, like, he looked at the piano as though it were a mystery. And you feel that in his playing. It's like, he's like, what's going to (laughs) happen? You know? So, like, there's, you know, there's power in that. There's this kind of really fresh energy in that. There's so few avenues to that experience as a professional musician. Because most people are not going to let themselves feel that vulnerable in front of people. (laughs) I tried to go to sleep in my haunted little room The shadows are churning in the passage of the moon And it break my heart to tell you that I couldn't come so soon No, it's nothing but a goddamn shame what it is always nothing but a guy. At home I had this really crazy old upright that was like a player piano and the insides had been taken out. 
So it had this like extra weird boomy quality to it. It had a great sound, but it was, you know, sort of hard to capture. And then the piano in the studio like sounded too good. And to some extent, Escondida is like a little bit too polished in a certain way, you know, compared to Catalpa. But it still has some mystery and depth. Tiny Idol and Little Missy, the piano intro is a song I wrote when I was four years old. No, I was six, which is totally ridiculous that I included it on here because they had the exact same model of toy piano that I had. So I just recorded it and then decided to use it for the intro for Little Missy. And that's, again, something I wrote in like five minutes And it was just like our friend was moving away, and I just wrote her this song. And the instrumental I actually wrote about some kid I met in first grade who was moving away, and it was like going to be a present for him, and I was like sad that he was moving away. And um, I was so shocked that I had written a song that I didn't tell anybody. I was like, can't let that get out (laughs) or something. I definitely never showed it to him. Well, I heard you're going up in California. Oh, don't you think we won't be praying for you? Oh, don't you think we won't be praying for you? I don't even think I really knew what Faded Coat of Blue was about. I mean, it's obviously a Civil War song, but it's about Gettysburg. Uh, my friend Stefan Jacusco did all the illustrations on Escondida, the like tarot card things. They're actually part of a tarot set. So I was a homeless teenager, and the very first squat I ever stayed at was Stefan's squat. And he had made this amazing, like he made two amazing tarot card decks and that was the second one. And Stefan had written this really sad love song to the tune of Faded Coat of Blue. And I was like, I love that song. What is that song? You know, what's that about? And it was like some super sad romantic song. And he was like, yeah, it's just, it's this like one of the saddest songs he'd ever heard. My brave lad sleeps in his faded coat of blue In a lone and solemn grave lies a heart that beats so true He fell faint and hungry among the family's brave And they laid him sad and lonely within his nameless grave On Faded Coat of Blue, I had never even sung the lyrics before that recording. I had never practiced the entire song with people. So I just had like, I had the lyrics out and the lyrics are just so heart-rending that like I didn't want to milk them for sentimentality. I just wanted to like, you know, I wanted to be like a super fresh performance like stumbling into the song yeah so much longing in that song he cried give me water and just one little crumb 
and my mother, she will bless you in the many days to come. Go and tell my dear sister, so gentle and so true, that I made her up in heaven in my faded coat of blue. Keith Carey plays banjo on that song. It's his grandfather's banjo from 1867, and it's a fretless banjo. Keith plays upright bass on the record as well. The bass that Keith played was an aluminum bass, so it's like this stripped silver aluminum bass, upright bass. They made them to play on ships, but normally they're painted to look like a base, you know, to look like wood. And he stripped it off, and it looks so beautiful. No more the bugle calls the weary one. Rest lonely spirits in the grave unknown. I'll know you and find you among the good and true. When the robe of white is given for the faded coat of blue. I probably made a really bad decision, like, um, or I'm sure I did. Um, Daniel Lanois wanted to produce my next record after this, and I said no, but I'll never get that chance ever again. <laughs> so I met him shortly after Escondida came out. He was like, yeah, it sounds... It sounds fine. (laughs) He said, but there wasn't, he said like that if he recorded my next record that he wanted to put in a lot more sense of depth and space. And I'm an idiot for passing that chance up. (laughs) But I had just never, like, this was like a co-production with me and Lemon to George. And I just wanted to produce an album myself so I wanted to do Springtime Can Kill You from scratch It was my first studio album, and I remember just being so amazed at having made it. I stayed up the entire night after we left. Like, when we drove back from Forestville, I just kept listening to it all night long. I was like, what is this thing that we just did? Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Jolie Holland. You'll also find a link to stream or purchase Escondida. Thanks for listening.